Hum was a, a kind of a gentle giant of a guy. He was well over six feet uh, and a very strong man. Um, also, a uh, very, very um, medieval, I, I'm actually a Renaissance type of guy, so I'm bored of his after. Um, Bob ran machinery in a factory, and he didn't have any kind of a college education. Yet he could talk to my wife about classical music, and she has a master's degree in piano. Spent a lot of his spare time watching old movies with his mother. Could remember everything, he had a photographic memory for things. Simple guy, he liked toasted cheese sandwiches for lunch, but at the same time he liked prime rib for dinner. Um, we're very fortunate in that one of his primary interests in life was anything that was driven by steam, whether it was a, a mill engine, a mining a hoist, a steam locomotive, uh, Bob would take a picture of it. And for our purposes, another fine attribute he had was that he would share those photographs with just about anybody that had a genuine interest. Um, the last decade of his life, I would say, he was really interested in doing a series of photographs of the Comstock as it was and as it is now. He would come up here with a couple of Watkins photographs and climb the hills trying to find the exact place where Watkins took that photograph 150 years ago. Uh, that may not sound like a lot of work, but besides his 35 millimeter camera, he had his huge box camera, a knapsack of film containers, and his tripod, and he did that by himself. Um, and he was quite successful, and I think Mike went up with him on one of those trips. Yeah, we did one. Yeah. We did Brunswick. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I did, did it with him as well. And he wouldn't let you carry anything. I don't think he trusted us. <laughs> um, but anyway, he had a sense of history about photographs at the record. And uh, in the 1970s, mid-1970s, when he uh, found that the engine house here had been vacated by his tenant, he came up a number of different times, mainly with his uncle, and they photographed the interior of the engine house. And if you knew Bob, that means he photographed everything in the interior of the engine house. And that's what you'll see here today. Now, my wobbly knees will not let me stand here for an hour, so I'm going to sit down over there, because if I walk back and forth, I'll drive this gentleman crazy. Um, so give me for a minute while I do that. Okay, let's see if this thing works. Hey! This uh, is not one of Bob's photographs, obviously, but and it's not the earliest photograph we have of the exterior, but I think it was Bob's favorite photograph because in his inimitable way, he uh, blew it up. He did everything with wet chemistry and a huge enlarger, and we found out a lot about, a lot about the history uh, that we didn't know before. Here you see, well, here, let me go back and make one point. Notice every engine, every uh, track that went into the engine house came off the turntable. Um, and this, this, was, this was very problematic later on for obvious reasons. How do you get a passenger car into the car shop? Here you see that the track to stall 11 has been modified so that it goes down. And uh, on that track, you see the um, tender for CNC engine number four on a flat car, and ahead of it you see the transfer car empty. So CNC engine four had to be in the engine machine shop being repaired. And of course the VNT uh, did repair and maintain almost every narrow gauge engine in the area. Here you can see the, the track going into stall five, I believe, yes, stall five, going through the engine house into the materials area uh, on the other side of the street. Notice the turntable at this point in time had wood siding and a rail on wood ties. Also, everything was in line, sort of. <laughs> and this was 1883. And I don't remember, Stephen, is this still the original turntable in 1883? It is. Okay. Notice we have <coughs> This, these two stalls are a bit set apart a bit. That's because these two tracks go into the car shop, 
and you had to have a fair amount of space between the tracks in the car shop. Here's the other part of that photo. You see a bunch of V&T flat cars here awaiting conversion possibly to picnic cars, or, or who knows, they've got stakes here. But back here we have the Armsby, which I think was the first time we realized we had a picture of the Armsby sitting next to the engine house. Okay, let's move on in time. Here we are, November 11th, 1931. Very different picture. These three stalls now don't come from off the turntable. Um, they, they come off from other tracks because they've been converted to other use. We no longer have smokestacks here, or smoke jacks here, which would indicate that maybe those stalls were being used for something else. We also have a switch here on the uh, stall one track so that you can now get longer cars into the car shop without dealing with the turntable. But you still have the rail here. Here we are, 1943. We only have, I think, one, two, three, four stalls in use off the turntable. We now have tracks off the turntable from, uh, from other areas going into the last four stalls but this one seems to be out of service. So we're already falling apart in a sense. Here's the turntable in April of 1950, just before things were um, abandoned. And you can see now we have a brick lining here on the pit with concrete, our, our, our cut stone here, uh, under the tracks that used to lead off of the turntable. And we have virtually nothing coming off the turntable, just this thing going through uh, stall five to the materials area. And of course, the arms be is gone. But almost everything else is the same. OK. Let's go inside. Here's um, a, a, a rather rough copy of the Habs diagram. Um, and of course, we're going to be talking about the interior here of this horseshoe-shaped building. And the reason that it was horseshoe-shaped was very common in those days for very large buildings to have courtyards like this, because you didn't have electrical light you were depending on incident light from the sun going through windows here and windows here and then through uh, clear, story, clear stories and uh, um, um, what am I looking for? The, thing, the things up at the top of the roof that you could get light through. Skylight. <laughs> Skylight, that's the word, thank you. Okay, let's move on here. Here you can see one of the shop areas. This, this is the uh, machine shop and uh, uh, pattern shop, etc. The other side looked very much the same, although I think the office was down here. Uh, you get an idea of how long this baby was and how enormous things were. And of course, all of the smoke jacks on top, you had uh, stoves to keep the thing warm, furnaces to melt uh, iron, etc. So there was a lot of, lot of stuff going off the roof, which I'm sure the EPA wouldn't allow today. Okay, here's the courtyard. Uh, that I was talking about, and uh, as I said, this is here primarily to get light in, but at the same time, you had to be able to get heavy machinery in and out of these shops, and you had to be, get materials in, and you had to fuel the boiler. So it was important to have rail access all the way through here so that the shop could function. Here's the courtyard as it looked in uh, 1974 in one of Bob's photos. Um, and as you can see, it was quite spacious. Uh, we'll talk about what these various these things were uh, in, in the rest of the program. Here it is in September of 1971, and you can see the famous crane. I, I think it, this is the one that we have parts for, I believe. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the um, area was occupied by the tenants' uh, uh, vehicles at that time. <coughs> Uh, that thing that, that was crossing the top is this structure here. Uh, here in the engine house, you had the prime mover, and it turned the wheels that turned the belts, and the belts that went to this side went through this corridor, and probably also some steam. Like everything, you had to get people up there to maintain things, and you depended on incident lights, so we had windows. Uh, but for any of you who didn't know why that little bridge was there, that was it. Here you can see the track that went through the courtyard coming, I should say, coming out of the engine house door. 
uh, going through to the material of the yard on the, on the other side of the back street. Okay, we're going to talk now about the engine house itself where light repairs were done. Uh, as you can see, there were 11 traps. Bob took most of his photos on the interior from either this corner or this corner on the middle. And then he moved over here to take pictures of the doors. And uh, he took one from here so we could see these doors and then one from here so we could see these doors. As usual, he took pictures of everything. So let's do that. Uh, here it was, and I've got the dates of these photos. He made four different trips. Um, this was after it was vacated by the National Guard. Uh, the only pits that were left were these guys here. Uh, you'll see another picture of a pit in the service, so it'll give you a better idea. Uh, the engine house, of course, was not on the ground. It was built up in the air so that the pits were at grade level, and the track was, was uh, quite a bit higher than the surrounding ground. Uh, this is the north wall. You can see the interior smoke jacks. This one was set forward, and I don't remember why it was not in line with the others, but that's the that's stall five where the materials track was located. And here are the doorways into the car shop. I don't know where Bob got this picture, and I don't know when it was taken, but it gives you an idea that when you start to put equipment into that engine house, it begins to look a little crowded. Uh, but the real reason I showed that is, here's a pit in fairly good condition. Stephen, do you know where this picture came from? I do not. Looks like about 1964, 65. Yeah, because there's this, this fence here, and I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, it's, it's a nice picture. Not too clear, but um, it does give you an idea of how much clutter you can get. Okay, we've moved up to the center of this wall here, uh, the front wall, and you can see the doors to the car shops. They slid, uh, I should say they rolled from, from side to side. Uh, in, inside, of course, here is an arch, arch doorway. Um, stall one and stall two, both going to the car shop. And here, again, was the remains of a pit, and I think also here. Now we've moved to the opposite corner, uh, and you can see the doors to one, two, three, four, five, etc. cetera. Uh, more smokestacks, uh, and of course, a wonderful tangle of, of wood required to support the roof. We're standing right in front of the door to uh, the, the machine shop here on stall 11. And here you can see the construction again, brick, wood, with a rail on top that, of course, is gone right now. If I'm going too fast with these pictures, just tell me. Okay, we've moved over to the center of the wall now, and you can see the store, the interior of the doors, three, four, five, six, and seven, latched to keep it closed from the inside, windows to provide light. Notice that the interior smoke jacks had guy wires to support them, keep them from moving back and forth. Here's one here. Here's the remains of one here. They, um, they were four points um, of the compass with the guy wires, both on top and below the roof. Here is um, stalls 11, 9, 10, 9, 8. One of these stalls doors had a, a, a human being door in it. I forget which one it was. Uh, to let people get in and out of the engine house from the front without opening one of the big doors. It looks like we had a minor collision here. It was right in the middle. Yeah. <coughs> okay, now we've moved to the front of the front wall, and uh, Bob shows us the entrance to the machine shop. Here is stall 10, stall 11. And we will go into the machine shop, which is this area here. You can see uh, this track going in, in and through. Actually, this track went in as well. Uh, this one did not. OK, we've just gone through the door. And we're looking at a very vast area of the machine shop. 
uh, again. Um, you see a lot of hardware up here. Uh, the ceiling was full of the supports for the pulleys, the, for the belts that drove the machinery. <coughs> you can see the door by which they got machinery in and out, and also large materials, large parts. And we've turned around now and looked at the, at the doors to the engine house here, and you can see the huge joists that were required to support all this weight. As I said, the ground was significantly below here. And here you see one of the furnaces to keep people warm. And the smokestacks, of course, went up and out. And auxiliary bracing. Looks like the roof at times got a little shaky. Here's a little closer look at the inside of the doors. You can see the racks up on top here. You can see that we have a smoke jack on, on track on track 11, but not on 9. So you could steam up a locomotive to test things on this track, apparently, but not over here. <coughs> well, this belt, this room looks very spacious, doesn't it? Well, here it is in the operation. Here is a narrow-gauge locomotive being serviced, perhaps number four that we saw the tender of. Standard gauge locomotive being serviced, all the machinery, and out of every machine, a belt. What is that? We do not know, but it could well be taken at the same time that the 1883 photo was taken. But any time you put in a new machine, uh, you had to put in a new series of belts, which meant somebody had to climb up here and uh, put in a two-piece pulley after they, of course, figured out how to get the belt around it. Uh, I would imagine they were, they were belts that could be tightened because there was no way to add a new uh, homogeneous belt in one piece to the system once it was in place. But that was life in the machine shop, and, in, and it stayed this way until the end. I counted 11 guys. Let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I think back here is another guy. There's 11. But you can imagine that no lights, <laughs> how it was working in this, in this environment, uh, particularly on a, a gray day in the wintertime. Okay, we're going to move now through another door from the engine, from the machine shop. Uh, into the blacksmith and boiler shop. Unfortunately, there was virtually nothing left of that, so we're going to move through the door again into the pattern shop. This is all that was left of the blacksmith shop. This, this of course, this overhead garage door is a later addition. Huge windows to let the light in. Still have the uh, framework on top for the uh, pulley drive system. This is the, um, the wall that separates the, uh, boiler, uh, the um, uh, blacksmith shop from the uh, pattern shop. So let's go to the pattern shop. Uh, here's the back wall. Uh, when Bob took these pictures, there were still patterns hanging on the wall here. Um, access stairway to get up to the loft where not only they, they could work on the drive belts, but also store patterns. Uh, here was an office in the corner. Jerry McGowan told me that when he grew up uh, in Carson in the 1950s, uh, patterns were still scattered through this building, and uh, kids were sent in to cut them up for firewood. <laughs> Here's the other wall. Uh, you can see here again there's a loft that goes all the way around. Here's, uh, the, um, some of the pulleys were still in place in this, in this particular room. Um, and we'll move around the building a little bit. There are still some uh, toolboxes there, or tables. Here's another view of that loft, and notice the sign. Please keep this shop clean. Very large pieces of machinery required just to drive the machinery. Notice the loft was held in place by tie rods. We don't know whether that's original, but probably over time necessary. We're going to move a little bit more to the right. 
Here you see those pulleys head on and some very large patterns that were left. And I guess they were too big and too heavy for the kids to climb up there and get them and cut them up. Nice to know where they went. Here's uh, the pattern shop in operation. Uh, I, again, don't know where Bob got this photo, but uh, I think he said the Nevada Historical Society has the original. This is a two-piece mold for uh, a boiler, a smoke box saddle, and a cylinder. You, you just basically put this on the other end, and uh, you had the, a, a, a pattern for casting the replacement uh, boiler uh, support and uh, cylinders. Tools all over the walls of various descriptions. Hammer. Another photo of the pattern shop. I don't know whether these are patterns or they are, or they are prototypes for making patterns. You can see this is already a casting. Here's a huge pattern for a, a casting of a wheel. Probably not for uh, the railroad, more likely for a mill. The VNT did a huge amount of castings for both the mining industry and the milling industry, and anybody else uh, in the area who needed a very large piece of metal cast. Uh, these, uh, these bright things are just sunlight coming through the windows. They didn't have fast film in those days. Okay. In order to move pulleys, you had to have a prime mover that was located in the engine house. Um, here's another small uh, building, which I'll show you in a minute. Bob, of course, went into these things. Um, Bob said that he thought that this was the um, foundation for the electric motor that replaced the steam drive. Um, let, me, let me look at his notes here and tell you when that was. Well, Stephen can beat me to it. <laughs> Let me see if you and Bob agree. You're right. <laughs> yes, it was 1902, 1903, uh, when we got electrification um, in, in the engine house. Again, you see the whatever was here turned big wheels and they turned big big belts that went up here and turned the pulleys and provided um, motive power in both directions. Still in place was the tool sharpening grinding wheel uh, with its water bath or oil bath and its drive pulley. I guess that was too big for somebody to salvage. It's in the museum. Yes. Yeah. Can you imagine being in that little room with that thing running, grinding some kind of steel tool, cutting tool without any headphones to keep you occupied? That's why they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Okay, we're going to go across the courtyard now into the car shop. Uh, two traps coming in. And here you see the wall between the car shop and the engine house with the two stall doors. Again, you can see the archway. Uh, these doors also slid from side to side. I took this in 1975. Again, your primary light source. Got no skylights. No skylights here that I could see. We're in the very back of the entrance of the car shop now, on the other side. The um, uh, walkway, the yard was over here, of course. Amazing how um, outside of the entrance house and the other buildings, the wood remained quite light and clean looking. No wood, no fire smoke up there. I should say coal smoke and oil smoke. Again. You can see the loft for getting up to and maintaining the drive wheels. And there's what it looked like in operation. You can see uh, this passenger car. We don't know, I don't know whether that's three or four. I never did find the numbers. Um, 
Bob make a note it was fairly early because there were no marker light brackets on this car. He thought that this was a tender frame. You can see the truck. You can see they jacked the car up. Now, how they got the wheels out is beyond me, but uh, they did it. They couldn't roll them this way because of the, the platform steps. But I'm sure they figured it out. We have, don't know, I think we think this guy was probably the foreman because he has his vest on. No hats, unusual. Everybody seemed to wear a hat in those days. But again, a very spacious room that got quite crowded when it was in operation. Here's the other wall of the um, car shop. You can see a nice, this nice uh, in code stairway here, probably five to one going up. Uh, and to get into the rafters again to maintain there must have been at least one guy who had a full-time job keeping things running in the roof. Hopefully he, re he retired with all of his fingers and, and legs and arms intact. Okay, we're gonna move into the foundry uh, and we've given Bob's fascination with machines. You can understand why he took lots of pictures. Here we've just gone through the door into the foundry with the big crane still in place. Turned so that it could pick up a load. If you could back a wagon in here, uh, and it could pick up a piece of heavy machinery or some cast iron slugs. Here you see one of the furnaces with its smoke jacks still intact, and the ubiquitous rafter hardware for the drive system. A little bit pick, closer picture of the crane. You had to turn one wheel to get this thing to go up and down, another wheel to get this thing to move back and forth. How they turned it, I think, was Armstrong. You see that the doorway out the back, out to the side here. No, no, that would have to be in the back. Another view of the crane. Again, you can imagine how the work environment was in here with the furnaces keeping you warm and the furnaces melting cast iron and the cast iron being poured. Shorts and t-shirts, however, were not allowed. Another picture. Notice these were taken at, at different dates and I, I don't know whether Bob and his uncle turned this baby, but obviously it's in a different uh, rotational position than it was in the other picture. And the hands-on view of what the guy who worked this thing did, guy because no ladies were allowed, not even women. Notice everything, everything was powered by chains. Eric, you gonna cast this up? No. <laughs> Head on view. Actually, I think this was probably the most fun job in the foundry. Except when the crane was carrying a bucket full of molten iron. Probably got a little hot then. I forgot to mention that in order to take many of these pictures, Bob had to use photo floods, uh, which he had to set up and power some way, and I forgot how he did that. Because there just wasn't enough incident light, uh, given the slow film in the box camera, of course, wasn't using ASA 600 film, but it was probably more like 25. Okay. Um, as an introduction to Bob Oaks uh, presentation, here is the engine house after the fire, or I should say the machine shop. Uh, we went through uh, in 1989 as part of one of our workshops, and you can see the st destruction was uh, pretty bad. Even burned out the doors here. 
And let me show you this. Uh, wonder who this guy with a mustache is? Stephen. Jerry McGowan. Back, back here is a guy with the New York City Police Department haircut. I think that must be Tom Smith. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure Bob would have done a much better job of talking about this because his memory far <coughs> exceeded mine. Any questions? Is there a chance of like posting this deck to the website or somewhere so we could? Well, you have to talk to Kent about whether you can put a PowerPoint presentation up there. I'm sorry I didn't have a handout, but when you shrink 37 photographs onto three or four sheets of paper and they're big pictures, you really don't see anything. I tried it. Well, there's anyway, just... I will talk to Kent and see what we can do. Thank you. Charlie? Yes. <coughs> yeah, oh. Some awesome photographs there. Has anybody considered a book or a large pamphlet on the issue now as a from start to finish? Um, well, yeah, everybody considers it, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Stephen and I have talked about trying to do something publish-wise with Bob's photographs. One of the problems is that the ones he didn't take by himself were copies of photographs he obtained from various institutions. And getting their permission to publish it is a full-time job in itself, particularly if they came from the Bancroft. So um, we have just not undertaken that, that task. Um, at some point in time, I, I have all of Bob's negatives and, and photographs, um, all of the non-Nevada photographs and, and, and negatives are now at CSRM in Sacramento. And sometime in the next two, two decades, they will probably obsession them and make them available. I still have all the Nevada and the early Central Pacific stuff from Truckee on down that related to the VMT. So, um, if you want to send me a, a, an email and say, do you have this photograph? If you can wait a year or two, I may be able to answer it. Um, Bob, unfortunately, because of his great memory, uh, did not label a lot of stuff, and his negatives are all filed by the date in which he took them. So to find something, you have to look through thousands of photographs sometimes. Um, I have the photographs segregated out now, but the negatives are still a problem. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, the shelves in the pattern shop had a bunch of small patterns. Uh, some of those were core patterns, others were probably just small parts. Yes, I think that's right. That's right. Anyone else? Heather, you're, you're moving. Do you want to ask a question? Am I what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Tom. to your riveting story earlier for the uh, wooden door cars, I'd like to start a splitting group. <laughs> Alright everyone, there is a change to the changes and we're going to take a 10 minute break in case anyone needs to uh, take care of any biological urges. So what I guess, uh, when I was still to contemplate, I had been asking, and I think it was my colleagues.